Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. My name is Carol Folt. I'm the president of USC, and you are part of the Facebook Live event, Earth Day at 50, What is the Earth Telling Us? I'm an environmental scientist, and Earth Day and sustainability have been topics I have been passionate about my entire career. And I know that we're celebrating Earth Day at a time when so many people are suffering from the effects of COVID-19. And I want to start by wishing you all well and saying how glad I am that you could join us with this conversation while dealing with so much else. When I came to USC, I was so excited to see that we had great students and faculty and teams who were interested in sustainability. And I started thinking from the very beginning, how could we bring people together to dream even bigger? Because the problem of climate change is an existential threat that will take an unprecedented level of coordination and teamwork and innovation. And honestly, the level of collaboration and innovation and teamwork I'm seeing as people come together to address COVID-19 is giving me great hope in many ways for the future. The faculty who are gonna be participating today in this panel all have contributed tremendously to this field in so many different ways. And they're gonna talk with you today uh, about ways that our views of the environment have been changing and the complex problems that we're going to face together to really look at a sustainable planet. They're gonna delve into ideas about population behavior, how people respond in the face of crisis, how decisions are made. They're gonna discuss how leading policy and scientific experts are playing a vital role and how universities like USC can actually be really important and should be important in this going forward. Both the public health crisis and climate change are interconnected in all of these fields. And I am so inspired to see how USC is taking a strong interdisciplinary approach towards working together on important issues like these. As we look to build on the progress we've been making in areas like carbon neutrality, encouraging sustainable education and waste reduction, we will learn the lessons of today and apply them in the future. And we're gonna need the strength of everyone to do this well from all disciplines. We're gonna need faculty experts and we are gonna need students to help us take this forward for generations to come. So thank you to the presenters and for everyone who joined us for your passion for making the world a cleaner, healthier, and more equal place. And I look forward to working with you towards our common goals for a sustainable future. So happy Earth Day and fight on. Thank you. Thank you, President Folk. Uh, my name is Dan Masmanian. I'm a professor in the Public Policy School at USC. And together with colleagues, Wendy Bruin de Bruin and Gail Sinatra, we're going to focus on the issue is, is to what extent is COVID right now bringing the Earth Day message home, but 50 years later? So I would like to turn to my colleagues first for a brief self introduction, Wendy. Hi, my name is Wendy Bruin de Bruin. I'm a new provost professor of public policy, psychology and behavioral science at USC. I started in January. So spent a lot of time at home, more than I wanted to. My research focuses on understanding and informing how people make decisions about uh, sustainable behaviors, health, and uh, finances. Gail. My name is Gail Sinatra, and I'm a professor in Rossier School of Education. I'm a psychologist, and I study teaching and learning about STEM science topics, particularly climate change. So in anticipating, I mean, in thinking through the question of the link between COVID and sustainability, I would like to pose at least a question to my two colleagues for us to discuss and, and share our thoughts on, which is, which is, you know, if you're, to what extent when you're already into addressing a pandemic as we are, um, is that too late to begin? Or do we need to think about if in, the, in the terms of policy and planning, going slow, planning, anticipating, preparing, in order to go fast when we're hit with a problem? I think both approaches are important. 
um, in, in the context of COVID-19, we had to respond quickly. Yes. Um, and, but there are also longer term solutions we need to find. And I think with climate change, it's the same. There's things we can do now and things we can do in planning for the future. A difficulty is that it can be difficult for people to think about what to do in the future when what's happening now is so uh, acute. And so framing decisions as things that are happening now, I think is, is, is important, uh, both for COVID-19 and climate change. The good news is, is that for climate change, a lot of people are maybe uh, are, are, are recognizing that climate change is important. 79% of Americans now are saying that they see climate change affecting their local communities. And uh, so people are, I think, ready to act. Gail. Well, I think the urgency of this current crisis has revealed a lot of things to us that are lessons we can take away and apply to sustainability. Uh, certainly responding quickly um, and responding to the urgency is a little different because climate change is over a longer scale, but it's shown us that we do have the ability to act collectively and to do some very important structural changes that could impact our long-term health and well-being on this planet. Well, you know, this, this question of uh, time horizon, what we've learned in policy for other challenges like uh, the pandemic, but they could be earthquakes and other natural disasters, is that people get very concerned at the moment, but it's difficult to carry the message into the future. And uh, most of the studies suggest that what is needed is not just policies, but it's needed two additional elements. One is leadership, which we can go back to, but the one I wanted to bring up right now was the extent to which we require behavioral changes among all of us, maybe even collectively to cultural change. And, and what we have, to, what we've learned or you've learned in, in our studies as uh, part of the academic research world, what we've learned about bringing about those kinds of changes. So motivating behavior change um, can be a challenge in itself, but motivating Cons uh, consistent behavior change over longer times can be difficult. And again, I think we're seeing this with COVID-19 where we've been told to stay at home. And I think initially a lot of people responded and we're still doing it, but it's becoming harder over time. And there's a push to um, stop that. And I think that with climate change, we will face, sim we face similar challenges that behavior change that is recommended um, uh, we can implement it, but how do we do, do it over a longer period of time? There we need help from our leaders and policymakers to implement policies so that, so that we can sustain those behaviors, uh, both financially and uh, in terms of our, our psychology, so that it's possible to uh, continue to do it, um, um, helping us overcome any difficulties in implementing those behaviors. Well, Gail, I know you've been a lot, you've focused a lot on the education about science, and the science tells us something about transmission and staying at home, just as the science tells us something about preparing for climate change. And yet there's a lot of people who simply don't accept the science or don't understand the science. How, how, do, we, how do we deal with this issue of understanding the science and accepting it? Well, it's challenging because both COVID-19 and climate change are very complex scientific issues. And there's uncertainty. There's a great deal more uncertainty in COVID-19. It's a new virus and everyone is just figuring out uh, how it's transmitted and uh, its time course. So there is a great deal of uncertainty there. So people struggle to understand what's accurate and what is, is the right thing to do to sustain our health with COVID-19 and to also sustain our planet with um, the issues around climate change? What individual actions can we take to keep ourselves safe and our families safe by social distancing, for example? And what kind of actions can we take to contribute to um, climate mitigation, such as uh, reducing our uh, consumption of uh, CO2, which would be helpful. So it's difficult to understand how these individual actions can impact these broader mechanisms. But I think with COVID-19, we're seeing 
that the social distancing has had a reduction in the spread of the disease. And if you look out over the skies of Los Angeles today, you will see how less um, CO2 uh, and other forms of air pollution from traffic has been reduced uh, during this time away from travel. So that's an indication that we can make a difference in our individual and collective actions for both of these challenges we face. You know, your, your point you brought up is an important one about the blue skies effect of, of the, the pandemic right now for those of us living in Los Angeles, but it also raises the, the tough, tough decisions we have to face in both situations, dealing with COVID and making choices about dealing with long-term effects such as climate change, uh, but the consequences of climate change, which, which comes back to then, I guess, thinking about from a behavioral point of view, when do people finally, or do they, uh, find these difficult choices palatable, especially when we deal with inequities? I think President Folk mentioned that, which is so much is concerned about today, just getting a meal today for some people not having a job that allows you to purchase and to pay your rent. So we're struggling with inequities and, and demands on ourselves today. And yet, if you take a look at the needs we have for sustainability, there will be comparable changes coming. So, so how do we phase into this in a more palatable, transitional way? So there's no question that both of these challenges uh, create differential impact um, in different communities will feel these impacts more strongly, which means we do need some structural changes. And we're seeing that now in the current crisis. Um, you know, not everyone has health care, and that's certainly a challenge right now during this crisis. So there are some structural issues. Um, transportation uh, is one on the climate side. Um, and we have to address these structural issues that give everyone the opportunity um, to contribute to society in a productive way that also uh, reduces our uh, impact on the environment. And climate impacts are also disproportionately affecting certain communities. And so understanding which communities are hit, hit the hard, hardest and uh, reaching out to those communities and help them to uh, protect them from those climate impacts is, I think, important. So this Earth Day focus that started 50 years ago formally, but has been with us for much longer time, really talks about paying attention to uh, the the earth that is our environment and and making making it uh, uh, sustainable in a way we talk about uh, going forward and yet we are dealing now when we think about the sustainability challenge we are facing uh, it's quite significant uh, so that that good behavior which is what we're thinking about in terms of dealing with both uh, to what extent do we know that it can routinely or easily scale up to the challenge? Or do we need more? I'm asking this about the, the behavioral side of this, uh, which always comes back to us, which is, uh, we mentioned earlier about people uh, 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 social distancing and, and staying at home, but we don't really enforce that in any formal way right now, at least in Los Angeles or our, our cities and our nation. Others may do so, but we don't. How in a democratic society, I guess the question is, when we really do respect individual choices, that we frame those choices in a way that people can understand they're win-win. They're work for, for you today, but they're also good for the, the future. Well, we also have to make them win-win, right? So we have to make it easy to take public transportation and affordable to own an electric vehicle. So all the choices that we want people to make, we have to make them easy for people to make. And I think people would prefer to um, have those choices and uh, would choose them when they're made economically viable. Wendy, I saw you nodding. Uh yeah, I, I think that there are uh, behavior change 
initiatives that we can think of where um, changing behavior can be beneficial to people for multiple reasons, or we can f uh, um, design our policies so that the behaviors are more beneficial. So if you make public transportation more comfortable and convenient, then people may want to take it more uh, and uh, then, uh, and that's good for the climate as well. If you want in a COVID context, um, have people stay at home, then you have to make sure that that's also something that is feasible for people to do so that those who can't work have enough money to afford to be able to stay at home. So you have to understand what the challenges are and what, what people want. Um, uh, if you want to help them with, with um, behavior change. Because changing habits can be difficult, but we are changing habits in the in in the con in the COVID nineteen context, and I think we are also already slowly changing our our habits in the climate context. So it is possible to do it, and so I think there's there's a, a positive message here. We can do this, and we can do this together. Gail, did you want to follow up on that? Well, just that we are working towards making these choices easier for people to make and affordable for people to make. And I think that there's a lot of um, buy into um, sustainable practices. Uh, but again, it has to be made available for everyone, it has to be made affordable for everyone, and people will choose them. Uh, those choices can, can be great. Uh, they can save you money. Uh, they can uh, be productive for you, but we have to make sure they're available. So as I understand both of your comments, which, which are intuitively attractive, uh, which is we have some obligation as a society, a governance, to establish the framework within which people are then being asked to change. And yep. change collectively on a scale that's really rarely done in terms of asking people to change. That's a challenge of the, the pandemic right now. We're asking people to make changes in their behavior that are dramatic and we haven't done before and on a scale we haven't anticipated. Uh, yeah, and so, so what's been happening in the COVID-19 message is that we've been clearly told that the main thing we need to do is stay at home. Whereas in the climate context, the messages have been much more confusing. There's so many different things we can do and what should we focus on first? It is not necessarily that clear. And this has led to some confusion. There are um, uh, um, members of society who are very motivated to do something about curbing climate change. Perhaps not everyone, but it's a sizable proportion. And the, um, my research shows that uh, uh, very motivated, self-identified green consumers are focusing on efforts to curb climate change that are not necessarily the most effective efforts because I think climate communications have been focusing a lot on trying to convince people that climate change is happening, but not so much on what are the most effective things that you can do to curb climate change. So we're finding, for example, that in households, people are fighting about who left on the lights. And um, uh, of course, turning off the lights is a good idea that will save energy and it will save um, CO2 emissions. But uh, in, in your home, if you want to uh, curb climate change, much more effective things you can do is to use your air conditioner less online dry your clothes and upgrade to more energy efficient appliances and similarly with food decisions a lot of people uh, motivated consumers who want to curb climate change are worried about reducing packaging which of course it's a good thing to do but if you're worried about curbing climate change then the most effective decision in the food context would be to try eat less red meat and so those messages have not been consistently out there and so there's a lot of confusion and and people who are motivated to change their behavior are not necessarily changing those behaviors that might be the most effective right and we have to make access to um fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables available for people to choose yes. those options. I think a lot of people may want to eat more fresh food, may want to eat less meat, but if you live in a so-called food desert where you don't have access to affordable and fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, then your choices are limited. So again, it's about people having the opportunity to make these 
smart choices that are going to be better for them and the environment. Uh, they have to have that opportunity to make that choice and they have to be affordable choices for people to be able to make. And I think they will uh, make those choices and would like to, um, but we've got to make them available. Yes. So I, I hear both of you saying then, thinking about this as a policy making issue, that our policymakers have to be more uh, concerted in their efforts and and think through the entire implication of asking or expecting, uh, which will be a benefit in the longer term in terms of having a more sustainable society and reducing or mitigating the effects of climate change and inequality that goes with it and the harm to our environment that comes with that. But being far more clear about uh, the path forward, the trade-offs, and the role of the, the public sector, but I want to expand that, it's the public sector working with business and NGOs, it's all of society working to ensure the choices are reasonably available or readily available. Yes, and then some of the policies that we need would be beneficial in the context of climate change, but also just, for example, if we're talking about giving people, giving communities better access to healthy food, it's yeah. not just good for the climate, it's good for public health, um, and um, so looking at those policies that have multiple benefits, I think would be a, a good way forward. Right, it's Earth Day and we we're talking about taking care of the Earth, but it's uh, really the benefit to us as humans that uh, results from having a sustainable environment. You know, we're talking about these issues and uh, they really are important. And of course, for among the three of us aren't necessarily new, but but clarifying, I think, what needs to be done is helpful to all of us, both those of us doing the actual research. But I want to come to the fact that many of the, uh, I think, uh, uh, in the audience think about USC as a place of education. And, and I just think I want to just segue back and, and comment on the fact that we heard in the introduction from our new president, Carol Folt, about the importance of both this balancing act between dealing with the present and the needs of the present while anticipating the future. And I just wanted to say for purposes of sharing this information, um, and I say this as chair of the, the President Fultz uh, a working group on a sustainable USC, that many things are underway right now that are going to be of uh, enduring value, but they're about today's education and today's behavior. And this comes from the educational mission of the school where these issues are being developed now about sustainability in all its facets so that every student that comes through USC will be informed of these choices and challenges. And also it's of course a major part of our research going forward at the university. And it's a, by the way, the institution for anybody who hasn't visited of late would be, would be surprised to learn about some of the things that are very visible the university is changing. One of them is simply the way we deal with our procurement through waste of food and other products that is being very conscientious about reducing uh, uh, a waste, but also being more efficient on our consumption and in Wendy's comment, being sensitive to what we purchase and make available and changing our habits and eating. The one thing that uh, I said, as you walk through, it's not quite true. Uh, our new Galen Basketball Center and arena is now, the whole roof is topped with solar panels. For the first time, USC has done this as a major project on campus of bringing solar energy and renewable energy to our campus, and it's just the beginning. So I want to touch on a few of those things because I, I think what we see ourselves as faculty and, and the staff and the students at USC is, is today, USC is trying very diligently, I think, to anticipate the future through changes that'll be of value today. And they can be monetary of value, or Wendy mentioned that could be less costly or of health value or of the actually built environment we manage. And by the way, not to, uh, not to understate this issue at all, the transportation footprint we make in Los Angeles and in the skies. So, uh, so that's what we're doing. But uh, to the extent to which the, either one of or both of you want to comment on in your own areas, how this is emerging academically or educationally as, as issues we deal with, I'd appreciate your comments. 
Well, I'll start. I know that USC is trying to provide many more um, opportunities for students in undergraduate and graduate programs to learn about sustainability. And those options will become available for students and will provide them with the education they need to work in our, our future, which will be around sustainability in as it touches every um, discipline moving forward. In education, of course, we want to also promote understanding of climate change and sustainability and science in general in the K through 12 and higher education environment. And of course, we're working um, in my research team and in many others towards um, producing materials and curriculum lessons. Uh, and a lot of people are working on that. Wendy, I know you're new and I, you may not have picked this up, but if you have any observations, you might, you might want to share them. I'm very new at USC, but um, I'd like to bring to USC insights from psychology and behavioral science about how to uh, promote behavior change and stick with the behavior change that you have started and would like to stick with. Um, uh, we know from different contexts that can sometimes be hard, but it's easier if the environment is designed in a way that makes it easier to stick what you intended to do. And so um, uh, I hope to bring those insights to USC. And I think under COVID-19, we're already learning that we are able to, it's perhaps not always ideal, but we are able to continue our research and our teaching uh, without uh, meeting in person all the time. And, um, uh, without relying on transportation. And so perhaps um, these are some lessons we can learn from for the future as we all hopefully go back to normal at some point. Well, Wendy, you are new, so you may not know about this, but it brings to point, it brings to, to mind your comment about the institutional framework for making these choices. Uh, our memorial uh, stadium, where we have our football games and so forth, uh, it is now 100% uh, waste, uh, waste zero as a facility. And that has taken enormous effort organizationally from procurement to people's behavior to sorting and recycling and reusing and really, really minimizing to a, a minute uh, the material that goes to a landfill. And in fact, our Gatlin Center is moving in that direction and will be 100% this coming year. And by the way, the USC uh, uh, Hotel is also moving to a zero waste appropriate strategy and we're hoping to expand this to the entire campus but it gets back to usc's like any other institutions obligation to provide the framework within which these good choices can be made uh, so that's just an example there as well as reducing our our carbon footprint which is down about 33 percent now over the last several years uh, and, and dealing with those issues so, so I guess the, the experience of Earth Day linked to COVID is COVID's actually telling us pretty clearly, if you watch how it's unfolding and how we're dealing with it, some of the things we need to be thinking about to, to facilitate and encourage a transition, the transition to a more sustainable society. And that's the link between the two. Yes, I would say that it's teaching us um, that we need um, good communication strategies regarding scientific information. And I, cer I certainly would advocate better K through 12 science instruction and more of it so that people would be in a better position to understand these complex issues like climate science and um, pandemics. We're seeing there's just so many um, uh, issues that people are confused about, and rightly so, because things are in the middle of a changing situation. But understanding some basics about science and how science works uh, would help us to confront both of these challenges. I think there are also some lessons from COVID-19 that we can learn for climate change. So one is COVID um, has been presented as much more acute um, it's all phrased as happening now and we need to act now, whereas climate change is often still framed as, oh, it happens in the future. And then it feels like less urgent to act upon it, even though climate change is happening now. Um, a second issue is, is that with COVID-19, there's been a, an, uh, it's, we've been able to quantify, I'm saying we, but 
I haven't personally, but the health scientists have been able to quantify the number of people sick and dying. And even though those numbers are still changing and, and, and it will change as, as, as we uh, be, are better able to test as well. But if you can quantify the number of people sick and dying from a threat, then you can quantify how serious it is, but also test the effectiveness of your uh, uh, interventions uh, to see how that affects those numbers. And that, that has not been done with climate change. It's perhaps harder to do, but it might be good to do. And then the third lesson from COVID-19 is with COVID-19, the message about what we can do about it has been very clear and consistent, and that is stay at home and stay uh, at a distance from other people. Whereas with climate change, the messages have been much more confusing. And so if we can focus on clear messages about a few main things that people can do, I think that could be helpful too. Well, well, as I see this, uh, uh, I've heard now we're talking about clearing the me clear messages, educating appropriately, thinking about the trade-offs and the time horizon, and the responsibility of our 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 national institutions, and I mean public, private, nonprofit institutions, to to really help frame the choices in a way that are palatable and realistic, and deal with the challenges of equity, hunger, uh, 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 and, and work that people deal with every day in their lives in order to have a better society. But I think what we're seeing that people are able to come together to um, to work towards a societal benefit, and um, even though it's difficult, but we're, and but we can be in this together and work together to make this happen. Now that's a good point uh, because it's easier to see the consequences of a pandemic in the now than it is to see the positive consequences of dealing with sustainability now that will benefit the future generations. So uh, that is one of the, I think, uh, uh, that, that is one of the, the challenges that I think we all face in terms of, of thinking about how do we act today in ways that are benefit to, to the future. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll see that clearer as we go forward in this. Are there other questions? I, I, I see ones come up because, by the way, for the audience, there is a question and answer. Um, how does the switch to take out food instead of dining in restaurants affect recycling sustainability goals? Good question. Any thoughts on that? Well, I've heard that cities have had to increase their trash pickup because of this, so it does seem like we are creating more waste. Gail, do you have a thought about that? I have actually an experience with that. Um, well, I'm sure that it is harder for, you, for families at home to manage recycling while they're trying to manage everything else that they're doing to maintain in this uh, crisis situation with COVID. So I'm sure that we're using more sort of takeout containers or maybe we're being less careful about plastic usage because we're really just trying to feed our families. I would just want to say from a personal experience of doing this trade-off because I am self-isolating with my, my wife and we do order in the food and the packaging. The packaging is a very serious issue. The trade-off is that the portions we are now receiving really uh, are, are tailored to the two of us and there's very little waste. So that we're trading off now not having food waste by and large, but dealing with the packaging that came in, some of which is recyclable and others of it is simply not. Uh, so that we deal with that personally. Let me just see, I, I'm having a problem. I'm gonna try and raise it up. See, another question. Uh, what's different about the environmental movement today versus 50 years ago? Well, I can um, start because I remember the first Earth Day and I remember thinking that um, we got this. We're um, going to solve the sustainability issues um, in the near future. Um, and of course, we haven't solved them. We have done many positive things. And um, I think the biggest difference between the environmental movement today and 50 years ago is that it is... Um, much more pressing problem now because uh, our CO2 has, has risen and our impacts or 
much more uh, seriously felt today than they were in the past. We're seeing the temperature rise, we're seeing ocean level rise, we're seeing um, climate um, migration where people have to move from areas that are no longer habitable. So we're, we're a little bit closer to the uh, need to act more quickly than we were 50 years ago. And I think there's more um, understanding of these issues than there was 50 years ago. You know, I lived through it too, Gail, and I think a comparison I would make, a contrast actually, was at the beginning of Earth Day and those, those early days of the environmental movement, there were good guys and bad guys. And the bad guys were business, they polluted, and the good guys was us, um, uh, concerned about the environment. Whereas today we understand it's not good guys and bad guys, it's all of us. Uh, it is individuals in our, on our behavior, it is business in their practices. It's in policy making and guiding society more effectively. Uh, there, there may be bad actors, but they're not about business versus the rest of us. It's about all working together to transform our, our means of production and economic behavior, our social behavior and cultural behavior, and our sensitivity to the environment. So that's a, I think that's a huge difference between when it began and 50 years later, we've realized the enemy, you know what they say, that we've met the enemy, it is us. Well, we're part of the story. I am not old enough to remember the first Earth Day because I'm the same age as Earth Day. But um, I uh, do think that uh, uh, one big change to follow up on what you've been saying is that there's now it's now much more mainstream to be concerned about climate like i said 79 percent of americans report being concerned about climate change and to see it affecting their communities and i think businesses are recognizing that sustainable policies are good business and that's a big change it is i agree we're now seeing that there's an advantage to sustainable practices both in in our homes I have solar panels on my roof and I have an electric vehicle and I've seen a huge economic benefit to my energy costs being reduced by both of those actions. And again, businesses as well are seeing that they can have tremendous economic benefit and cost savings by adopting sustainable practices. So I agree with you that um, those that's a big change from the past because certainly there's benefits to sustainability that people are beginning to realize. I'm looking at another question, probably our last given our time, uh, but it has, what's the difference, uh, uh, why, why solar only on Galen? Uh, uh, for those of you who know his campus, it's a large campus with many buildings. The, there are many answers to that, but one is this is the first, it's not the last, we just kind of have come to this recently as a university. Two is we do get most all of our electricity from the Department of Water and Power of the City of Los Angeles, where we're one of their major customers. And that electricity itself is being generated through renewable energy. So in a very rapid way, pace right now, the energy we purchase from the Department of Water and Power is renewable, and we're complementing that with our own on-campus renewable. So we have a dual strategy. The only question really here is how fast do we in fact move to 100% renewable? And that's a challenge to the city and its speed and USC in adopting its own or adapting its own uh, 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 renewable energy strategies. Um, so I'm looking at our queue givers and see if we have any more questions on this that we might close with. Uh, any other thoughts or comments as we close? Well, we just want to remind people in response to that last question that also Wrigley uh, Center out on Catalina Island is going solar as well. Yes, thank you. Wendy, your final thought for the day. Um, it's been great to take part of this panel and um, I uh, think that uh, we can, even though these are difficult times, there are ways that we can come together as a society across the world to uh, address these big challenges. Gail. I just wanted to thank you um, uh, for hosting this event and thank our president Folt for her initiatives in sustainability because we're in this together and she's been a great leader on this issue and will continue to be 
And um, please feel free to share this recording and um, with anybody who's interested. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, on anybody interested, by the way, one of the places you can learn about what USC is doing is on a website called green.usc.edu, which is a little plug, but a lot going on on campus, and you can pick up a great deal about that on that website uh, for the for the entire campus. And to uh, to to Wendy and Gail, thank you for sharing your thoughts, and 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 I appreciate this because we come at these from very different perspectives on the campus, and and that makes for a much more productive productive conversation. And I think that's where our university is addressing this issue from a myriad of perspectives in order to have not only a, an effective response to COVID, but in fact, a palatable, reasonable, cost-effective, and successful transition uh, in, a, in a challenge that's brought to us through climate change and a new sustainable society. Thank you all.